The area that we call Melanesia is made up of the large landmass of New Guinea, as well as clusters of islands ranging from the Admiralty Islands and New Caledonia down to Fiji. The land of New Guinea ranges from sea level coasts to mountains of over 4,000 meters, beyond 12,000 feet. This results in a distinctly highland lowland set of ethnographic and mythological themes and separates it from the tiny social networks and mostly sea level living of the Micronesians. While it appears that the origins of the world did not much interest early Melanesians, they seem downright passionate about how that early world came to look like today's. And as we have seen in many areas of East Asia and Oceania already, just because there might be a paucity of cosmogonic tales hardly means that people ignored questions of how human life and culture came to be. Tales of how the Melanesian world was adjusted are endless in their variants. Unlike what we found in Micronesia, the missionaries and anthropologists who collected these tales did such a thorough job that we can only touch upon some of the most prominent themes in the rich mythological corpus. How the sun and moon came to be set in their places has occupied the thinking of people in all parts of the world. One Melanesian story ties those origins to another prominent theme, fire. In the beginning, it was said, one old woman was the sole owner of fire, and she guarded her secret jealously. Only she ate, only she ate cooked food. At his wit's end, her son remonstrated with her, calling her cruel and explaining that uncooked fish and especially taro root skins burned people's throats. And still, you do not give us fire with which to cook. She was unmoved, but, the, but he stole some embers and gave it to the rest of the people. The old woman was incensed and grabbed at the rest of the fire, flinging it into the heavens. There it broke into two large and many lesser parts, becoming the sun, the moon, and the stars. Another group of tales echoes Japanese mythology in that the sun and moon were considered living beings. And, as in the Maui stories of Polynesia, there are many that focus upon an earlier world of perpetual night or day. In one tale from the Bank Islands, the Melanesian culture hero Cut sought to bring the rhythms of day and night to his people. As it was, life was oppressive because the sun always beat down on the, on the land with great intensity. Cut's brothers complained of how unpleasant it all was and begged him to do something about it. Well, this Cut was a sharp guy and he functioned a bit like a very early mythical anthropologist. He had heard that way off in the Torres Islands, there was night. Taking a pig with him, he hopped into his canoe and made for those faraway islands, plying the waters that would become, that would come to be the trade and exchange route for later canoes. In the Taurus Islands, Cut exchanged the pig for night. Moreover, the living person of the night helped Cut to train for this new experience. He blackened his eyebrows, taught him how to sleep, and then instructed him on the details of making the dawn. Back home, Cut began to set the changes into motion. He had his brothers make beds of coconut fronds, after which he initiated the slow descent of the sun. The brothers were alarmed and cried out to him that the sun was crawling away. Cut calmed them, saying that this was the beginning of the nighttime for which, which he had traded a pig in the Taurus Islands. Soon it grew very dark, and the brothers shouted that something black and awful was growing out of the sea. That is nighttime, Kat replied calmly. Now lie down on your coconut fronds. As they began to drift towards sleep, one brother, terrified, asked, Shall we die? I think we are starting to die. That is called sleep, answered Kat, with the patience of a culture hero making great changes. Now shut your eyes and sleep. And then, after a sufficient time had passed, Cut took red obsidian and cut the night with it. The cocks began to crow and birds began to chirp. Light shone again, but it would thereafter always be accompanied by rest-giving darkness. One can't help but be struck by how much the fears of Cut's brothers resemble those of young children who are learning to sleep in the dark by themselves. 
Perhaps the first tellers of this tale had their own children or their own childhoods in mind as they sought to capture and explain the mysterious nature of their world. At the very least, they understood the mysteries of the dark and the confusion it could create. Cut is also featured in another of Melanesia's fascinating human creation tales. In it, he cut wood from the tough, sinewy, twisting Dracaena tree and carved it into six statue-like figures, three male and three female. When they were completed, he hid them away. This is a theme in the mythology that is never really explained, but I liken it to a kind of gestation for the artificial figures. In any case, after three days, he brought them back out and set them up again. Now the story begins to merge with the rhythmic social themes identified by Marcel Granet in Chinese mythology. Music brings the figures to life in this tale, just as it reinvigorates the social order for Granet. Dancing before them, Cut beat the drum and coaxed them into their own initially awkward dance movements. Before long, they were singing, dancing, and fully a part of the rhythms of human social life. From my perspective, these details of dancing into life are among the most profound we have encountered. If we know how to look for it, and it is by no means easy, we will see traces in many parts of East Asian and Oceanic mythology, where music and dance create or sometimes restore life. In addition to the image that Granet described of Chinese peasants dancing in the fields before the spring planting, the Japanese sun goddess was coaxed from her hiding place by dance, and the festive chanting and dancing of the Hawaiian Makahiki festival was used to beckon the god Lono so that he would provide the sustenance on which life depended. In each case, rhythmic movement and song brought humanity, and even occasionally gods, back into the circle of social life and supported life itself. This powerful idea goes back to Marcel Granet's teacher, the French sociologist Emile Durkheim, 1858 to 1917. In his seminal work, The Elementary Forms of Religious Life, he asserted that it is in social gathering, often accompanied by rhythm and song, that mankind reaches its highest levels of social engagement and intellectual reflection, what most societies call religion. And to my mind, that is exactly what Kat is doing in these myths. In a Durkheimian manner of speaking, he is giving them religion. Put in another way, he is coaxing them through patterned movement into full humanity. But this happy tale about the mythical creation of humanity is not over yet, and it takes a nasty turn. Well, the good and kindly Kat had a malicious and jealous neighbor named Madawa, who was not at all pleased to see the joy in Kat's household. This Madawa was determined to create his own people and took a different kind of wood. The type of wood varies throughout the variant tales, but it is clearly noted that it was not Dracaena wood. Madawa, too, carved images and set them up, beating the drum just as Kat had done. His figures, like Kat's, came to life, but then things changed. Madawa dug a pit, covered the bottom with large coconut fronds, and dumped in the dancing statue beings. He covered up the pit and left it that way for seven days. When he dug the figures up again, they were not only dead, but also decomposed. Madawa had created life and then brought death to the world, and so would it ever be henceforward. In Japan, Hawaii, and Micronesia, Death comes about because a powerful being declares it to be so. In this myth, however, death is a result of carelessness at best, a theme in other myths throughout Oceania, or active malice at worst. It is fair to ask whether such a perspective reflects or shapes Melanesian worldviews in significant ways. I think not, at least not for the most part. The tales of Melanesia do not seem to be darker or more focused on evil than other regions we are studying. I tend to consider it, rather, in the following manner. Death is so much a constant in human experience that almost every mythology needs to explain it. And sometimes the explanation is more unsavory than others, as it is in this case with the spiteful Ma Madawa. 
In our desire to understand the people who created the myths of Oceania, few places carry stronger weight than Melanesia. Indeed, it is hard to imagine the field of anthropology without it. So let us take another look at what I like to call the mythology of anthropology. Looking from this perspective, studying the studiers, as I like to put it, we can see a bit more about the people who have brought us the stories of oceanic culture. Here is how the great founding myth of anthropology is often told. For a good portion of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, scholars who aspired to be anthropologists spent a great deal of time sipping martinis on South Sea's verandas and interviewing natives who had been brought to cities such as Port Moresby in Papua New Guinea. To bewildered islanders in the big city, they would ask questions such as, what is your religion? And how does your kinship system work? Predictable results followed, mostly blank stares. And then, this is how the tribe called the Anthros usually tells it. One person saw how futile it all was. He put down his drink, slid off the couch, hired a dinghy, sailed to an island, built a hut, set up his typewriter, and studied the lives of people that, as they were actually living them. More specifically, this new kind of anthropologist, culture hero, went to the Trobriand Islands in the Solomon Sea off the far western tip of Papua New Guinea. He stayed for four years, from 1914 to 1918. Not the least because other Europeans were too busy with the Great War to pick him up. And above all, he wrote a very big book. His name was Bronislaw Malinowski. Malinowski's seminal ethnography of 1922 changed everything. Even the title is larger than life and echoes mythical themes. Argonauts of the Western Pacific. Anthropology would never be the same after it was published, nor would the study of mythology. Imagine what it must have felt like in 1922 when the library shelves held the writings of amateurs who had traveled to distant lands without any serious idea about how to approach them. Then, suddenly, the study of myth and culture became less of a hobby and much more of a profession. From that moment on, the study of culture and myth would require scholars to get their boots dirty. During the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, and 1950s, Argonauts was the gold standard for everyone serious about what Native peoples thought and felt. So sturdy was its rigorous structure that anyone writing about culture, society, mythology, and religion sought to emulate it. The great anthropologist wrote in the third person, and the text could lull a reader into thinking it was written by a very special authority, a kind of anthropology god. And then, in 1967, the mythology of the anthropologists took a very peculiar turn. Forty-five years after his seminal work was published, Malinowski changed the entire field again, and in such a way that it is still churning today. Mind you, Malinowski had already been dead for almost a quarter century, since 1943, but a posthumous publication with the blessing of his widow shook anthropology to its very foundations. You see, she published his diaries from those years in the Trobriand Islands, and they were unlike almost anything resembling the deific and dispassionate primal ancestor and culture hero of the profession. It was shocking stuff, and anthropologists did not know whether to laugh or despair at the alternating, alternately titillating and enraged passages in the journal he had entitled, and surely meant to be, a diary in the strict sense of the term. One moment he hankers for the warmth of native embrace, the next he rages with anger at slights from neighbors. It is unclear whether he actually followed through on any of the feelings noted in the diary, but it makes for strangely compelling reading. If you have ever been frustrated by language, custom, or manners in a foreign land, imagine four years of those frustrations and writing them all down. That gives you a pretty good feel for the diary, perhaps minus the rather more vivid entries. And ever since the diaries were published from the late 1960s right up until now, anthropologists have pondered whether there really can ever be a way to study other societies 
without feeling, without being involved on some level with the very story they are telling or the myths they are analyzing. This turn toward what we call reflexivity, a kind of inward looking while studying others, has been a healthy, if disconcerting, outcome of the diary's publication, and it has everything to do with the study of mythology. In my own case, an awareness of reflexivity has led me to understand that the way we write about other societies does not just add to the knowledge, it changes that knowledge profoundly. We cannot take down a myth or explain a custom without being a part of it ourselves. Our very explanations, just like mine here in this lecture, shape how people learn about native ways. We must never forget this. So, this messy new reality changes forever the way we look at mythology. And yet, as messy as it is to have to study the studiers too, I, for one, never want to go back to that earlier world in which anthropologists and missionaries really thought that they were just the transmitters of native tradition, passing it on to the public without the traces of intervention. It's harder this way, but I think we actually learn more in the process than we did in the old days. Let's look at these issues in a different way, by means of another Melanesian myth. There was a culture hero in Papua New Guinea who often, in the guise of a snake, passed through villages all over the islands. He brought fortune and good luck with him and would linger for as long as he was fed and treated well. If, by chance, he had hostile interactions, he would leave a wake of negativity that persisted for some time to come. We could look at this tale through the lens of good and ill, as we have already done with other myths. Let's try something different, though. Let's consider it from the perspective of trade between the islands. And here we have a situation in which mythology and ethnography truly come together. You see, there was an ancient practice of gift exchange, so it is told, that goes on to this day among the islands off of Papua New Guinea. In this elaborate ritual, people stand in a circle and pass ceremonial armbands in one direction while they pass intricate necklaces in the other. But that simple description barely scratches the surface of the ritual's significance. Almost every anthropologist knows of this ritual because almost all of them have read Argonauts of the Western Pacific, which remains a very fine book. There, Bronislaw Malinowski described the exchanges of gifts, ritual de decorum, and status surrounding the practice which he calls the Kula Ring. Malinowski had set out to study economic practices among the Trobrian islanders, but when he chanced upon islanders, this, the islanders' peculiar cycle of gift-giving, he found himself utterly baffled. Once he examined it more closely, Malinowski discovered that the process worked like this. Only people of a certain status took part, but these influential men passed shells, armbands, and necklaces among their peers from other islands. These exchanges were not random. Indeed, they were based on extensive relationships that they and their peers had developed all over the islands. In order to participate in the rituals, the men built canoes, stocked them with goods, the most important of which were the armbands and the necklaces, and went on journeys of exchange not unlike Kot's mythical trip to the Torres Islands in pursuit of night. And here is where it gets even more interesting. The real status that the men attained through the ritual came from giving away precious items. The receiver accepted a significant gift, but that gift in turn compelled him, pressured him really, to move, move it on, to become a great gift giver himself. For us, these exchanges have a further interest. The fact that islanders were compelled to take long voyages to other islands means that more than just armbands and necklaces would circulate. So too would ideas, often in the form of mythical tales. These journeys helped to create a wider identity than people confined to one island could ever feel. They have a glimmer of the social commun communion of which Marcel Granet spoke regarding ancient Chinese festivals, and many scholars have noted the importance of these exchanges in integrating the social fabric of the islands. 
Above all, though, these journeys and exchanges are significant because they show that the tiny islands were linked in ways that few people other than the islanders themselves understood before Malinowski's book. Let us proceed from ritual exchange to Melanesian myths about how bad things were brought to the world. As we have seen, not all social interaction turns out in the positive. One of the most popular features of Melanesian mythology is the brother pair of To Kabinana and To Karvuvu. As in many other tales, sibling rivalry makes for legendary social dynamics, and conflict can be seen everywhere. According to one tale, the two brothers were walking in the fields one day when To Kabinana said to To Karvuvu, Go and check on our mother. In an odd piece of follow-through, To Karvuvu heated the oven, killed his mother, and roasted her. And there he left her remains in the stove. Returning, To Kabinana asked if To Karvuvu had taken good care of their only living parent. I have roasted her in the oven, he replied. Shocked, To Kabinana shouted, Who said to do that? I asked you to check on her. His br brother replied, Oh, I thought you said to kill her. Sorry. To 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 Kabinana called his brother a fool and said, And now our descendants will cook and eat the flesh of humans. The myth does not go further, and it is unclear in its message. Without the last line, it appears to be an extreme and even tragic case of utter foolishness. The last line intrigues, but the story ends right there. This is often the case with myth, and we have sometimes have to adjust our assumptions about narrative closure accordingly and keep looking for hints in other myths. So let's look a bit further. In another story of the Toe Brothers, more evil comes to the world from this relational foolishness. One day, To Kabinana carved an elaborate fish out of wood and let it float upon the ocean. He then made it alive, and the great fish drove smaller fish near shore so that they could be caught. Great plenty was about, and all was well. To Karvuvu, seeing this, sought to imitate his brother. He carved a fish, as he thought, and placed it in the water. His work was none too careful, though, and it resembled far too closely a great shark, which, coming to life, ate up all of the other fish. You are really a stupid fellow, said his brother. Now all of our descendants will suffer, since the shark will eat the other fish and errant humans as well. As you may have noticed, it is not malice that is at work here. Rather, it is a pe peculiar kind of dense stupidity on the part of To Karvuvu. Foolishness is a relationship here, in the sense that To Kabinana seems constantly to work for the benefit of humankind, for example, making a great fish that drives smaller fish to shore. Whether well-meaning or not, Tokar Vuvu seeks to emulate his brother's deeds, but fa fails in listening, accuracy, or even basic understanding. As we have seen, both of the Toe brothers, To Karvuvu and To Kabinana, are integral to, mythology, to a mythology that crafts a world in which humans will eventually live. They help to shape how the world came to be the way it is. And yet, it is not only the good brother who shapes that world. In each case, the nature of things people experience today is the combined product of the brother's wisdom and foolishness. This is a creation tale that merges wondrous insight with utter inability, even to follow directions. The creator in Genesis, or even the founding myths of Japan, would likely have been bewildered by the creative abilities of the Toe brothers. So now let's examine a tale about ogres and cannibals. It comes from the Sulka tribe on the eastern end of New Britain. Once there was a cannibal and his wife who had eaten scores of people from neighboring villages. This so alarmed the village folk that they stocked up their canoes, loaded up their belongings, and set out to sea in pursuit of a safer place to live. It so happened that a woman named Tamu was about to give birth and asked to delay the, the voyage for a little while. Her kinfolk and fellow villagers left it anyway. 
Worse yet, when Tamu desperately pursued them in the water, they beat her back with the oars until she finally gave up and went back to live in the village alone. In time, she gave birth to a son. When he had grown somewhat, she would leave him in their home while she tended to the all-important garden. One day, she gave him a Dracaena plant with which to play. Remember that Dracaena was the wood from which Cat fashioned his human beings. Before long, the plant turned into a boy, and Tamu's son suddenly had a companion. He hid him away, and in time even built a partition separating himself from his mother. Every once in a while, the mother would hear conversation, and she was bewildered by the amount of food that her boy consumed. In time, she came to know the secret and was actually delighted to have two sons. Now that there was a lively movement in the once deserted village, Tamu feared that the cannibals would come and take them. The boys told her not to fear, that they would take care of any cannibals. They practiced their martial skills and set up slippery barricades around the house. As they gained confidence in their skills, they taunted the cannibals with come and get us shouts. And so the cannibals came, slipped upon the barricades, fell down, and were set upon by, uh, the, by the boys who killed them. They cut them up and burned their bodies, saving only the breasts of the cannibal wife. These they put in a coconut shell and set it to float on the seas as a message that the cannibals were dead and the village was safe. And back came the people. The brothers, angered by the ill treatment of their pregnant mother years before, said they would kill their fellow villagers. But in time relented and the society was made whole again. Conflict and resentment was followed by restoration of harmony. Does this myth reflect real life in the Melanesian islands? Was the cannibalism reflected in it and the story of Koto Karvuvu cooking his mother part of Melanesian culture? There actually are relatively few cannibal tales in Oceania, but you wouldn't know it by listening to many early missionaries and explorers. It is not by chance that Westerners seized with a peculiar kind of fascination upon the idea that the Pacific Islands were filled with cannibals. They were aided in this by a number of sensational correspondents who fancied themselves experts on the topic, among them a world traveler named William Edgar Guile. 1865-1925. Guile was no Bronislaw Malinowski, but he was a consummate orator. In the 1900s and 1910s, he held audiences wrapped with tales of cannibals in the South Seas. I have spent more than a little time studying the life of this odd half-evangelist, half-anthropologist. Leafing through his archive in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, I have found dozens of newspaper articles describing Guile's close encounters with cannibals in the Pacific Islands, and of missionaries and the occasional trader who met a sad end in the cooking pots of the islands. The problem is that most of this is preposterous, and that cannibalism, as we have come to understand it all over the world, is almost always the ritual consumption of tiny bits of a defeated enemy not a regular means of nourishment. Few would argue that such an unsavory ritual practice is minor, but it is very different from what is usually conveyed by tales of South Seas cannibalism. The images that many early travelers promoted of islanders gnawing away on human thigh bones is just short of being an insanely twisted myth, one that says more about Western colonial fears than it does about the nature of oceanic societies just short of that. And the reason I cannot just leave it at the mistaken understandings of Westerners is that similar kinds of fears show up in all sorts of Melanesian tales about cannibals. We have seen just seen one. This doesn't make the Westerners right in any serious way. What it rather speaks to is the rumbling fear of the unknown shared by the islanders themselves. If you have ever worried about trolls in a dense Bavarian forest, or just read a tale or two from the Brothers Grimm, you will understand the nagging fear of cannibals in Melanesian mythology. And here is how I interpret this and other myths we have explored in this lecture. The French anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss once said, I paraphrase in translating to English, food is good to think with. His point was actually a quite profound statement about the nature of mythology. 
whether about food or other topics. We err if we think about these myths too deeply in terms of their content, their plot lines, or their meanings. I realize how strange that may sound, but bear with me. Levi-Strauss was saying that the story is only part, often a small part, of what is going on in any myth. Myth itself is a way of formulating, experimenting with, and articulating many things beyond the storyline itself. Think about the story of life and death with Kat and Marawa, the tale of night and day in trade, the Tow brothers, and the odd outcomes they seem to spawn, and especially our cannibal tale. Could it be that cannibals are good to think with? Could it be that cannibals might well be a way of discussing not only the unknown forces in the next village, but also the way we might treat others in a crisis? Could it be that myth is much more like a sonata, which we hear note by note, of course, but which also, at the same time, appears to us as a total experience? Claude Levi-Strauss thought so, and devoted his life's work to explaining it. I think so too.